those in the middle and good evening for those in other parts of the world. Uh, I really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sonny Magania and uh, the title of this webinar is called Disruptive Classroom Technologies and in it uh, in during this presentation I'll share a new framework for innovation that I've developed uh, over the course of a 35-year career researching the impact of education and technology. My background is as an educator. I was a biology teacher and a mathematics teacher for a number of years. I was a building principal, a district level technology director, and I ran various state technology initiatives. I've done a lot of research in this area that I'll, I'll mention during my webinar. Um, and uh, I currently work with uh, uh, a number of schools that are just not satisfied with the impact their technology is having on student achievement. And that's a problem. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, and again, there will be some, a chance to get some polls and some questions. Um, I, this is where you can get a hold of me. Uh, at Sunny Magani is my Twitter handle. Um, you can go to my website, which is maganiaeducation.com. And so that's a little bit about me and about this work. This was from a new book that I've just written called Disruptive Classroom Technologies, a framework for innovation in education. And it's different than other technology integration frameworks because my framework focuses on research-based pedagogies that are enhanced by technology. I've developed this framework called the T3 framework. And so just take a look at the structure of this framework. Uh, there are three dominant uh, headings, and I call these domains translational, transformational, and transcendent. And these domains represent categories of the impact of technology's use on student achievement. The research is really clear about how to best use technologies to unleash students' limitless learning potential. And I've organized this hierarchy so that way you can use it as a lens to recognize and view technology use currently, set some goals and some uh, meaningful challenges for yourself or for your staff, and then continuously monitor and track your progress as you move up to the different levels in this framework. You can also see that I have some subordinate headings that are called elements. Automation and consumption are the elements in translational technology use domain. In the transformational technology use domain, I have two other elements, production and contribution. And finally, in the transcendent domain of technology use and impact, I have two other elements, inquiry design and social entrepreneurship. So you can think of the T3 framework as both a hierarchy, because as you move further along and higher up the levels in the framework, the technology use will have a greater impact on student achievement. But you'll also think of this as a continuum because there may be times that you go back down to automation and consumption and move throughout these levels with agility. So let me first address some pre-webinar questions because it's really important that um, we think about not just impact, but impact in the future. So there are gonna be new technologies that are gonna come into our uh, realm in the next few years, how can we ensure that teachers are engaged in continuous growth and mastery uh, with technology when we don't know what those technologies might look like? The answer lies less in the use of the technology and more in the principles of use of that technology. And I think that'll be more clear as we um, go through this webinar. It, this is framework is a framework of principled application and integration of technology to enhance pedagogy. So no matter what new technologies you may um, experience, slotting the use of the, those technologies or viewing them through the lens of the T3 framework will help ensure that you have continuous growth towards mastery. And there is a very diverse research base for this work. Uh, I've been doing this research for over 35 years and I've combined my research as well as the research of Robert Marzano and John Hattie. And I'll talk a little bit more about the diversity of this research base because it included learners of uh, all grade levels, all content areas, and in uh, different parts of the United States and in the world. Um, and then finally, if people are interested in how do we sustain students' engagement? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pause there and say, I'm gonna talk about how we can not just uh, motivate students, but unleash their passion for purposeful learning, for limitless purposeful learning. And that is a function of what I call transcendent technologies. 
So now I'm going to ask you a question. Think about um, uh, this in your learning environment right now. How would you rate the average impact that technology has on student achievement in your school? And uh, uh, Derek is going to uh, post a poll right now. And what I'd like you to do is think, just reflect and, and share the response. The average impact of technology in your school, would you say the impact has been very low, low, medium impact, high impact, or very high impact? So take a moment and click on that poll. Just choose one of the radio buttons and, and then hit submit. And um, as you're doing that, I'm going to share a couple of other things. So first you have to start out with the here and now and consider how technology is being used in your environment. Okay. Now, we'll get, uh, look at those uh, responses in just a few moments. So let me ask you this. Why do we need a framework for innovation? And we have had other frameworks. Okay, so most people are saying medium to low impact. Good, These are, thanks for sharing the uh, uh, results, Derek. So low impact to medium impact. And that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon, but think about this. We have invested billions of dollars in infrastructure and in hardware and software and training in, on conferences, and I, I fear that globally, we've developed learning environments that are digitally rich, but innovation poor. Digitally rich, innovation poor learning environments do not move the needle of impact forward. Now let's talk about what the research says, because everything that I do is, is based on um, a preponderance of evidence. There's a um, researcher that I'm working with who very graciously reviewed my book named John Hattie. And he's probably um, done some, uh, the most incredible work in terms of helping identify instructional strategies that have a high probability of being effective. And he developed an effect size scale. If you can look, think of this as an odometer. There are certain interventions that have negative effect on student achievement, low, medium, or high. The interventions we want to focus on are in this zone of desired effects. 0.4 is the average of all effects that uh, Professor Hattie studied. And so anything that's in this zone of desired effects, it would be considered reliable instructional methods. However, when John looked at uh, the re recent research on the impact of technologies, he studied over 10,000 um, meta-analyses or reviews of technology and found that the average effect, the average impact of technology on student achievement is 0.34. 0.34, which is very low and below the average impact of any other intervention. Here's what's even more alarming, is that the impact of technology hasn't changed in 50 years. So for 50 years, despite phenomenal changes in technologies, the average impact is 0.34 on student achievement. So it's well below the zone of desired effects. And that's a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem because we need to have a framework that um, resolves the uh, low impact use of technology by categorizing uh, different uses of technology in terms of low, medium, high, and very high. So let me explain that a little bit further. I, the first level of the framework I call translational technology use. And to translate something is to just express uh, uh, an idea or an action in one modality and then change it or translate it to another modality so the message or the intent stays the same. Translational technology use is simply technology use that changes tasks from an analog environment to a digital environment. And the two elements that I have for translational technology are automation and consumption. This represents the majority of how technology is used in learning systems to automate administrative tasks like data storage, recording, communication, budgeting, and testing, or having students consume digital information from a web page, from uh, an ebook, from an online resource, a blog, or a wiki, using iPads as consumption devices, or laptops or Chromebooks, simply as devices for students to consume information. That's how technologies are generally used in schools, and that's why the impact of technology is so low because we're the way it's used is primarily for automating tasks 
or having students and teachers consume information. 0.34 is very low. So let's go to the next domain, transformational technology use. And I define that kind of technology use as the application of digital tools in order to make a substantive change in a child's understanding, consciousness, or cognizance. So the child is no longer the same after using these tools. The effect size of the strategies in this transformational domain were identified by Robert Marzano and Marzano Research to have an effect size of 1.6, not 0.34, 1.6, which is an exceedingly large effect. That effect size is equivalent to gaining an additional three or four years of academic achievement in a single year. It's tantamount to tripling or quadrupling student learning. The amount of information a student will learn in one year would be equivalent to an additional three or four years. Another way of looking at it is that it may take a child one week to learn something that it would normally take three weeks or more. Now, that's a really remarkable thing. And to put it in, in scale, uh, remember the average effect is 0.34 of, in, of technology tools. The effect of the strategies in the transformational domain are quite literally off the scale. And that's something we need to pay attention to. I think we need to apply these and continue to explore how these strategies um, merge effective pedagogy with effective technology. The first element I call production. So instead of just having kids consume data and consume multimedia information, it's far more effective to have students produce representations of what they know, uh, establish what I call a mastery orientation, where they track and, and monitor their effort, their progress, and their affect as they move towards the learning intention. So there are three strategies within production, and I'll just talk about them briefly. The first is that students produce a mastery goal that is strategic, it's precise, and it's measurable. You have to start with the learning intention. and. Um, uh, the success criteria as students move through the three different phases of learning when they're engaged in surface learning, deeper learning, or knowledge transfer. Children need to know which phase of the learning they're in and which strategies help them achieve high levels at each stage when they track their progress, their effort, and their affect and they're reflective of the strategies they use, then they build a toolkit of new strategies that they can apply at different times. Then they can produce authentic knowledge and thought artifacts using digital tools that represent what the child knows, what he or she can do, and how he or she thinks about it. An example would be podcasting is a wonderful, uh, freely available mechanism for students to share their, their understanding. Uh, Nate Butkus is a six-year-old who has a very popular uh, podcast called The Show About Science which is great. Nate is a kid who loves science and he just can't help but share his love of science with the world and produce, he produces this digital artifact to show what he knows about science. We can do this with many tools, with screencast tools, with blogging tools, with web page building tools. Uh, there's no limit. The key is that students are representing their knowledge as a way of describing how they've achieved the learning intention and have mastered that learning intention. The next element in the transformational phase of technologies I call contribution. And I think that's an idea whose time has come in education for kids to be able to contribute to each other's social and educational well being in the classroom. And I think contribution provides an opportunity for whole learning systems to learn together and engage in development of collective efficacy, the collective capacity of an organization, whether that organization is a classroom, a grade band, or a school. There are three strategies to contribution that are highly researched and really effective. The first is, you know, students need to contribute to the learning environment. So they contribute to the promises and commitments of that environment, and what are the attributes that make for uh, a highly uh, accelerated learning system where everyone contributes. The second is for students to produce tutorials to teach others what they now know using many of those tools that I just mentioned, screencasting, blogs, wikis, web pages, audio recordings. It's one thing for students to consume a tutorial from some academy. It's far more important for students 
to produce a tutorial that's designed to teach someone else what they now know. And then students curate those authentic tutorials in some online repository, like a museum. That engages a very powerful strategy called knowledge transfer, where students, when engaged in knowledge transfer, deepen and consolidate deeply acquired knowledge. We know as teachers that we learn the most when we teach. That's an example of knowledge transfer. So this is a way you can use technology to engage in peer tutoring, having upper grade students teach knowledge to lower grade students or to one another. It's a very powerful strategy that's associated with very high gains and achievement. Uh, an example would be mathtrain.tv, which is a website um, developed by a friend of mine uh, named Eric Marcos in Santa Monica, California. And his fifth grade students are teaching the world math by creating tutorials by students for students that are consumed by students. That's a great example of contribution. Transformational technologies on the whole, production and contribution, are designed as six strategies that you can uh, engage in and, and as teachers track and monitor your progress because that helps build mastery for current learning. But an arguable point of education is to prepare students not only for current learning, to master current learning, but also to master future learning. And we don't know what that looks like yet. That's why I decided to add another domain to the framework called transcendent technology use, because that helps students master the skills, the habits, the aptitudes that are necessary for mastering challenging new future problems that we don't know what that might look like. And to transcend quite literally means to go above and beyond a normal range of experiences or expectations. And I think transcendent technology use is an apt description for the kind of technology use that goes well above and beyond the limitations and expectations for which organized education was developed. The first uh, element I call inquiry design. And that's a process that really helps ignite students' passion and their purpose, not just for learning the content at the moment, but for recognizing that that content and procedural knowledge that they're gaining can be applied to improve their world. The question from the uh, individual at the pre-conference, the pre-webinar question asked, how can we continue to have students motivated uh, in, a, in a BYOD environment? When students recognize that their learning is a means to a greater end, to making the world a better place, now we're no longer teaching content. We're not just teaching skills, we're letting students become leaders for social justice, to become active change agents to make the world a more humane and just place. There are three strategies associated with inquiry design. And the first is have students identify a wicked problem that matters to them. Now, it's a great term, <laughs> wicked problem. And um, people think I'm a surfer uh, when I say wicked or I'm from Boston, but it's actually uh, uh, in the research literature. Uh, Riddell and Weber defined a wicked problem as a problem that is highly complex, many facets, it's intractable, ill-defined, ill-structured, and is yet unresolved. We should stop asking kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And instead ask them, what wicked problem matters to you and how are you going to solve it? So the next two strategies help students design an original inquiry into identifying what that problem is and generating resolutions that have may have worked in other places that can they implement locally and then defend their unique knowledge contribution and iteration. This is the thesis process. And when you do, when you earn a master's degree or a doctoral degree, you're told you're going to make a unique contribution to the knowledge base. My question is, why do we wait so long? You know, I, I'm working with uh, elementary primary grade students that are making a significant contribution to the world by identifying a wicked problem that matters to them, brainstorming and coming up with a problem statement investigating and hypothesizing solutions to those problems. A wonderful place to delve into existential problems that are wicked is the um, uh, sustainable develop the goals uh, for sustainable development. And the sustainable development goals were developed by the United Nations as um, uh, uh, things that we can teach students so that we, they can improve their world. These aren't just 17 wicked problems. These are 17 domains of wicked problems, from ending poverty, 
improving gender uh, equality, reducing inequalities, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions. When students see that they can use their learning to make a difference in their local community by, and, and then they're part of a larger country, larger network of learners, all striving to improve their world, that transcends the um, limitations for which public education was designed. But let's not stop there. The highest value of technology is what I call social entrepreneurship. And that's when students engage in activities to solve wicked problems that matter, that may be of a social justice na nature or one of the 17 domains of wicked problems. And they become leaders to make a positive social impact on the world by improving social capital, doing good, and building value at the same time. Social entrepreneurship, I think, is another idea whose time has come. Um, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is a learned skill and they're very strat strategic things that kids can do to improve their ability with social entrepreneurship. The three strategies are to have students use existing open-ended platforms like blog building tools, webcasting tools, app building tools, or uh, coding environments to imagine, share, create and reflect upon iterative new environments or tools that represent solutions to these wicked problems that matter to them. They could be uh, raising awareness, using uh, social media or other platforms to uh, make uh, uh, the problem known. That's tantamount to moving towards a solution. Then have kids beta test and iterate and generate more robust versions of their digital solutions, scale their implementation and reflect upon the impact that they're having. Those two elements, inquiry design and social entrepreneurship, really help students better um, become better ready, more ready to face future learning problems. Uh, a couple of examples, Malila Ulmer was a, a stung by a bee when she was very young and it scared her, but then she started learning about bees and learning about colony collapse disorder and she decided she wanted to do something about it. She decided that uh, colony loss was a wicked problem that mattered to her. So she created a little company called Me and the Bees Lemonade uh, that uses local honey and a large portion of the proceeds go towards education uh, and uh, services to promote uh, urban and suburban beekeeping across the country, which is beautiful. Uh, Natalie Hampton was a, a child who's bullied in elementary school and she decided that the loneliness associated with bullying was something she was a wicked problem that she wanted to solve. So using a free app building tool, she created an app using social media and geolocation uh, to have students sit with each other during lunch. And so she develops an app called Sit With Us. That's a great example of social entrepreneurship. She's doing good. She's solving a wicked problem that matters to her and generating value. One of my former students was a math teacher uh, who developed a company called MasterTrack uh, to help teachers improve their ability to teach mathematics at a primary grade and uh, improve student learning uh, through a, a tracking process. So it's very possible uh, to have students uh, develop all sorts of opportunities to make the world a better place. It's the transcendent learning that uh, prepares students for future learning situations. And that's an important element because with, with transformational technology use, uh, students can learn more in a given amount of time. So you're gonna, increase the efficiencies of your learning system. And that'll make time in your curriculum when students learn that content knowledge to apply transcendent learning experiences. And in a nutshell, that's the T3 framework. It is a whole, it's a hierarchy as well as a continuum uh, for students to, and teachers, to wield digital tools to prepare them for, to master current learning in the transformational domain and then prepare them to master future learning simultaneously. We need to move through these different levels and recognize where we are in order to build our capacity. So now I'm gonna ask you another question. How would you characterize the average use of technology in your school? Um, Eric will be um, uh, putting up the poll, thank you. Would you characterize or categorize the average use of technology as translational in nature, transformational in nature, or transcendent? So while he's doing that, I'm gonna look at the um, chat because there was a question or a comment, I think that popped up in the chat. Um, 
How does this type of framework, especially in the transcendent sphere, work in younger grades? And how does it balance with the surface skills and knowledge needed to be successful at higher stage? Great question. Thank you very much, Michelle uh, Kaufman, Michael Kaufman. Um, when a school system engages in transformational technology use, and we move through the different levels of um, production and contribution, that the, the strategies in that framework were associated with a 1.6 effect size, which is an acceleration in student learning. When those strategies are implement, implemented with reasonable fidelity, um, the content knowledge that students need to gain in your schools will accelerate. The amount of time it takes for kids to master that learning will decrease, and that will over time uh, create time and space in your instructional day to engage in uh, problem-based learning, uh, transcendent learning. It takes time. It, it, this, don't think you need to go to transcendent learning immediately. Find out where your school is doing. One of the things I do as a consultant is I come in and help you identify um, the current status of your school and what is the predominant uses of technology in your school. And then from that needs assessment, we do an implementation plan with um, synchronous and asynchronous professional development for coaching and for helping teachers establish meaningful goals monitor and track their progress. So over time, you'll create more space and time in your instructional day to engage in those transcendent activities. But don't think you need to get to it right away, because you don't. Uh, Derek, do we have the uh, results of those polls? There we go. Okay, so now you're doing what I hoped you'd do with the framework. You, you see it and it makes sense, and now you can categorize the use of technology. So 71% uh, of us have uh, uh, think the average use is translational. Um, a very small percentage feel that it's transformational and some feel it's transcendent. How do you measure that? How do you continue to uh, move forward? Well, that's where the T3 framework comes in. The T3 framework comes in to help you um, identify um, uh, the different strategies, where you are and um, how to move forward. I've got one last um, um, poll question is, uh, I want to know, are you interested in learning more about implementing the T3 framework to accelerate learning in your school? So thank you for putting the poll. Um, are you not, in not very interested, interested or very interested in implementing the T3 framework and accelerating student achievement and passion for lifelong learning in your school? And I don't think there are any other questions in the chat. And Okay, folks are interested and very interested. It's good to know. So here's how, thank you very much for that. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing uh, your thoughts with me. Um, here's how you can get a hold of me. Uh, my email is, you can meet, Twitter me at Sunny Magani or go to my website, sunnymaganieducation.com. Uh, I'm working with international schools all across the world um, in, to embed this framework for innovation. Um, my um, uh, mentor, Robert Marzano, is also interested in researching the effects of these different projects that I'm doing, as is Professor John Hattie. Um, he recently reviewed my book and said that the T3 framework is how will um, technology make the difference that we're after. And so the possibility for us to engage in some um, action research, which would be delightful. So I'll, I'll reach out to you and um, let me see if there are any other questions. I'll go over to you, Derek. I was just going to say we can pause for a moment and see if anybody else has a question. If not, um... Uh, just type it into the, if you do have it, type it into the chat. We can uh, get to that in just a moment. Otherwise, in the meanwhile, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Magana, and thank you for sharing your work today. Um, I know that your, your book was available, I believe, at the conference, and uh, where else can you get your book? Is it on? Yeah, it, thanks, Derek. Uh, thank you very much. It is on Amazon.com. Okay. Uh, so you can find it there. It's also on Barnes & Noble. Um, it's available as a kin, uh, Kindle version on Amazon. And um, uh, yeah, I, I look forward to hearing back from everyone that's interested in reading it and implementing these strategies to really unleash students' limitless learning potential. Great, and I'm not sure if you may know, but in uh, Kindle world, not every book is international. Do you know if yours is? It is. Uh, I know that uh, schools in um, various parts of the world were uh, accessing my book on Kindle internationally. Um, so, but if you're having any difficulty, let me know, uh, and then I can um, uh, connect with my publisher. Corwin uh, Press is the one who published the book, um, and we can figure out ways to get uh, uh, this uh, content to you. I know that's a challenge in some uh, uh, 
uh, world locations. By the way, I just put my email in the chat. It's sunny at maganieeducation.com. Um, and there was somebody, uh, this question, no question. I like how this framework bridges the gap between technology based frameworks like SAMR and high effective teaching strategies. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. In fact, I'm building on TPAC, which was research based. SAMR is not research based. There are no strategies in SAMR, so it's really difficult to observe and really difficult to measure. But I think we need to honor where we've been, and I've developed this framework to build on other existing tools. So thank you for that comment. Lots to think about. Okay. Thanks again, and I uh, hope everybody has a good day or evening where you are. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at other uh, future webinars at AIE.org. Uh, and thank you again, Dr. McGonigal. My pleasure, Derek. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.